What's up, guys, and welcome back to the Uncultured Cinematic Universe. Uh, each episode, we take a look at classic and iconic films from two perspectives, that of the diehard fan and that of the uncultured, who's never seen it before until now. And uh, that is Joe. Joe is the uncultured. He, uh, I am the uncultured. He is. Uh, so if you notice, you know, this is my second episode in a row, and I'm very excited. Uh, so speaking of, uh, we're your hosts, Justin and Joe, and today we're taking a look at what I consider to be the perfect love letter to Halloween, 2007's Trick or Treat, or Treat, it's apostrophe R, Treat. Uh, as a reminder, you can watch us on YouTube or listen to us wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and the like. Just search for The Uncultured Cinematic Universe. Uh, and also find us on Instagram at UCU Podcast uh, for updates and fun little tidbits and, uh, you know, whatever else we throw on the story and feel like is is relevant and fun. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's don our costumes, leave a jack-o'-lantern lit for <laughs> Sam, and let's get into it, Joe. Uh, we're we're going to talk about Trick or Treat. Yeah, five five episodes into our podcast, and we're already breaking our own rules, but... Halloween is definitely your season, so I'm really glad we were able to kind of have have a, a mini series that was more Justin Run than Joe. But I promise uh, November is going to be my month. We're going to double up on Joe movies. Uh, yeah, coming up. I'm ready for Joe movies. I'm I'm ready to to <laughs> give the reins over to you and not do as much homework and just sit back and enjoy a movie for fucking once. It is um, a little bit easier being the uncultured rather than the one that has to kind of do the research here. <laughs> You're right. It, it is so much easier to just sit back just on your hands and just kind of enjoy the information wash over you. Um, again, so last time uh, we did Over the Garden Wall and we did something a little bit different as opposed to watching in uh, our different spaces, our different homes. Uh, for Over the Garden Wall, I went to Joe's house and we watched it there. This time for Trick or Treat, a treat of sorts. We went to the movie theaters and saw this movie for the 15 year anniversary. They decided to bring it back into theatrical release. Well, not even back, not even back. Cause I told you this on the way there, this movie has never been in theaters before. I was it, surprised by that. Yeah. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but yeah, this was a straight to DVD release cult classic. Uh, yeah. So before we get any further, uh, let's go ahead and do this and we're going to watch the trailer. Joe, this is so much fun. This is a really good one. Uh, I think you're going to dig it. So here we are. It's R, by the way. This is rated R. It's rated R. Buckle up. I'm scared already. <laughs> This is the one night. Don't forget your costume. All sorts of things. Roam free. The Halloween school bus massacre. I hated that kid so much. <laughs> what is that? Wait. There's another tradition. Always check your candy. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. I hate Halloween. 
<laughs> so good. That is a great trailer. You know, they they captured the whole thing in it. Mm. The, whoever's whoever cut that trailer, you know, they they did a good. Yeah, job. it's 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 a very um, it's it's not a normal narrative for a movie to have. It's kind of intersplicing between four different stories, four and four and a half ish. Um, yeah. So having to put all those together, I think they really had a a well rounded take on that in that trailer. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, for the audio listeners who couldn't read what was going on between uh, some of the shots, there's this one that that uh, that I caught. You know, it says it unfolds, or one of the reviews says it unfolds like Pulp Fiction, and it 100 percent does. And um, that's an important thing to call out uh, about this. So, if if you've been keeping track, all of the movies that I bring up or think the series that I bring to the table. They're all fucking anthologies for some reason. And I don't know what that says about my personality or my psyche, but uh, I just enjoy an an anthology kind of storytelling for some reason. You love a circular plot. You love individual vignettes. I do. And uh, yeah, so like Pulp Fiction was my first one. um, And that obviously was the the cornerstone for it. And Over the Garden Wall unfolded in that kind of similar way of just like individual Mm -hmm. stories. And then this one does too with Trick or Treat. Um, But yeah, so let's, I'm going to hit you with some numbers and some basic overview of this movie. Um, I had a fun time digging into this, uh, just learning about it. There's there's some some neat gems in here. So yeah, so this was written and directed by Michael Doherty. And this was his uh, directorial debut. Joe, mm-hmm. would you believe that i would believe that just because it was like released on dvd it didn't seem like they were planning on uh spending a lot of money on distribution here however in terms of just like horror movie tropes he really seems to have a good understanding of what he wants to pay uh homage to versus what he wants to kind of like Uh, turn on its head a little bit Uh, definitely this guy studies film he has studied film for sure uh (laughs) some of his his resume so he was a writer on x2 that's x-men 2 the sequel the good one from the the original from the original three uh also a writer on superman returns a uh controversial superhero interesting one yeah um so a follow-up that he did to trick-or-treat he also did a wrote directed produced so he was wearing all three hats uh for another horror movie centered around a holiday called krampus and that one is another one of my favorite like holiday style kind of horror movies um i'm not going to subject us to watching that this december i'll save it for next year Uh, but it's a good one it's got similar vibes i haven't seen it but i know of it it seems like he's really this director is really kind of building a niche for himself and like the gritty horror slash comedy genre because uh yeah. there's definite comedic undertones to trick or treat as there well definitely is uh and then here's the here's the other one one of his most recent ones that he brought to the table was godzilla king of the monsters he did that one he uh, wrote and directed that one as well that one's not as funny but <laughs> i also i really enjoy the godzilla movie i you know what i haven't spent much time with those at all i saw like bits of the like the original like new reboot or whatever with uh like mm-hmm. Aaron Aaron Taylor Johnson and uh Brian Cranston in it. I saw that one, but I didn't do the follow up like the next three movies that they did. Uh and I obviously I saw this the nineteen ninety six one with uh Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick, yeah. Where so Godzilla is just like a dinosaur. Yeah, I need to circle back and and see some of these new Godzilla ones, as well as the tie into the King Kong movies, right? I need to do that too. The uh, the new Godzilla movies are really great in I don't really care about the human characters as much because they kind of change uh, between movies, but they're kind of spectacular in how they use slash don't use Godzilla. Mm-hmm. I think like in the in the first one, he doesn't come in until like over like 40 minutes in or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and then it's very climactic at the end. And there's there's moments that had me just like crying from uh just pure energy in the theater. Oh yeah. Um, Love that. When he's, he's fighting some of these monsters. It's, they're really great. They're like the fast and furious with me. They're just perfect movie theater movies. Right. Yeah. Just, you just a big bowl of popcorn, um, alongside, you know, a big 20 ounce can of whatever the hell you got from the fountain. The but yeah, so, yes. yeah, I love it. <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, Michael Doherty, you know, he loves to sit in the director's chair as well as, you know, put pen to paper. So I commend him for that. Uh, I don't I don't know how, how, you know, common that is these days. But yeah, so this movie was completed, wrapped and ready to go in 2007. But it didn't hit shelves on the D- of the you know DVD counter until 2009. Um, this movie was first shown at film festivals and sorts. The first one being this hilarious one I never heard of before. It's called the Butt Numathon <laughs> in <laughs> December of 2007, uh, and then several other film festivals uh, throughout 2008. But yeah, l- like you said, the the studio wasn't super confident in the film. Uh, they didn't want to release it uh, alongside. Uh, I think they were doing a um, another one of the Saw movies was coming out, so they didn't want it to release alongside there. And then also, Superman Returns didn't do super hot at the box office the year prior, so they were kind of just like, you know what, we're just gonna wait for a bit and just go straight to DVD. Interesting. Yeah, it seems like it's kind of very much in the in the time period when straight to DVD movies were hitting their heyday before like Netflix and stuff hit. Right. But Um, usually usually that meant, you know, like uh, the death knell for some of these movies, they would just barely make a blip and then go away. But this one did not. I think this one just had like the quality and the uh, again, we'll get into it, like the the surprises in its storytelling to kind of stand out from the crowd. Yeah. We'll talk about it like towards the end about just how this movie reached cult status. Um, it's, it's a really neat, neat kind of thing to, to glom onto because it's, it's unheard of for a lot of movies that go straight to DVD to kind of gain this kind of popularity. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, so this movie had a $12 million budget, relatively small. And, um, yeah, alongside it, there was a small run of comics that were supposed to tie in to the film's release uh, but never happened, obviously, and just got packaged up on the shelf and was released as a, as a graphic novel in 2009, which I'm feverishly trying to get my hands on uh, comics like this. Uh, Over the Garden Wall also did comic a comic run, uh, but those mm-hmm. are also notoriously hard to get a hold of. But I, Yeah, the uh, movie's kind of bookended by comics in the credits on both ends. You can kind of see where the inspiration for that came from. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, in a bit we'll talk about you know how Michael Doherty came to this um, this idea and, and brought it to life. But before we do that, uh, gonna get past the the spoiler hurdle and mm-hmm. gonna hand the microphone over to Joe, and we're gonna do the the plot, the Joe plot go, if you're ready. Uh, and you know what? How much hearing, time are you giving me? I'm gonna give you two and a half minutes again because this movie's okay. all over the place, and uh, you know heard from the fans. Uh, that uh, maybe you cheated a little bit by writing it down. Everyone is saying that I cheated with Over the Garden Wall, which was a mini series, so cheating in and of itself. <laughs> and so to prepare for the plot description of Trick or Treat, I have not prepared at all. Thank and it's God. going to be fully off of my head, and we'll see what gets in there versus not. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to stress about it. Good. Don't even stress. Don't even Don't even trip, dog. All right, so we got two and a half minutes on the clock. I'll hold it up for you just so you can keep it going. But uh, whenever you're ready, take a deep breath, breathe in and out, and here we go. All right, uh, Trick or Treat is a movie about Halloween. It takes place on Halloween in a small uh, Ohio town that's obsessed with Halloween. It's in modern days, and it kind of tells the story of four uh, vignettes uh, around this town that you realize are interconnected interconnected in more ways than you think at first. So starting with... uh, there's a principal of a school who's giving out candy, uh, and he turns out to be a serial killer. He kidnaps a kid that he gives uh, cyanide to after having a really creepy talk with him on the on his front porch. <laughs> when he uh, kills the kid and tries to bury him in his backyard, he keeps getting interrupted by his super annoying son who wants to go trick-or-treating and uh, carving jack-o'-lanterns, uh, who's yelling, yelling out his window uh, in the middle of the night at this guy. Um, and the... Uh, This is like the most anxious serial killer of all time. And he goes in and you think he's going to kill his son, but it turns out he's actually carving uh, the kid that he murdered's head with his son. And the son is really into it as well. So uh, they got you on that one. Uh, Okay. The second uh, story that's kind of happening at the same time as this 
is uh, Anna Paquin is with a, a group of friends and they're all kind of dressing sexy for Halloween, except she's kind of the the virgin. She's giving off real like final girl vibes uh, in a slasher movie. Yeah. And they're trying to find boys to bring to this party that they're going to in the woods. And minute. her sister keeps mentioning her mom and that she was the runt of the litter. And I definitely called the ending of this one before it happened. And it turns <laughs> out that uh, they're actually werewolves and they're looking for a uh, uh, boys to take into the woods and kill and then they go and they turn into werewolves uh, once they kill them uh, the third story that is happening at the same time involves these uh, kids who are uh, going around collecting jack-o'-lanterns to uh, throw into the quarry where a bunch of kids in the 50s died when a bus driver uh, who was paid by their parents to kill them drove the bus into the quarry um, 20 and seconds Oh, God. And the kids bully this other girl and the girl ends up leaving them to die in the quarry when the actual zombified uh, kids from the bus end up killing them. And then the last story is Brian Cox plays the neighbor of the serial killer. And it turns out that he's the bus driver and he gets into a fight with Sam, who's the uh, spirit of Christmas. That's kind of been like in all of these stories the whole time. Love it. Done. Wow. You're done. That was close. You spent a lot of time. You do this. You spent a lot spent of time. A lot of time on, on the, the front there. On the very front end. But you, you got it in there. You got to Brian Cox, which is great. Um, yeah. Well done. Yeah, this is tough because there are, you know, like you said, there's four distinct kind of things going on. But damn it, do they ever interweave? Um, mm. I know you noticed that, like, at a couple points during the movie, you're like, oh, it's the people from the beginning. Or yeah, I kept else. on, I kept on gasping at you. So, <laughs> so what I didn't mention in my plot description is that it's. It's a very uh, circular narrative in that it, it starts in the same scene where it ends. There's a whole entire scene where uh, Sam, who's who's arguably the main character of all these stories, he he's this little uh, masked uh, uh, five year old looking kid in uh, pajamas. Uh, and you never really see his face until the very end. And he's kind of the one going around making sure that people follow the rules of Halloween. There's something supernatural about him. Mm. Um, and if they don't follow the rules of Halloween, he he kind of kills them. Yeah. And so he starts out by killing uh, Leslie Bibb. Uh, and I spent about five minutes in my head during that scene figuring out whether or not it was Leslie Bibb. Uh, because I couldn't. I was like doing math. I was like, is this before or after Iron Man? She looks way too young. Is that just an actress who looks exactly like Leslie Bibb? It was Leslie Bibb. Yeah. Um, so he kills her. It starts out the movie. Uh, and then you don't really realize it, but all the other characters are kind of crossing paths at that point. Then you go into their individual vignettes. And then at the very end, it comes back to that moment. And so the, the stories are kind of told out of place in time, uh, mm -hmm. as well. You don't really know what's happening at what point. Yeah. Um, I meant but to, it's really fun how they, they interact in that way. I meant to go back and like write out what's the chronological things of the, that really happens. And mm -hmm. I mean, you can kind of infer it just how it, how it all lays out. But yeah, like that intro specifically, like in the first 10 minutes um, is where a ton of overlap happen. I highly suggest going back and watching it again. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that every single time go back and watch the intro. You can see the zombie kids like shuffling off screen. Cause they just, or they're on their way to mm -hmm. Brian Cox's house. Um, in another quick shot, you can see Schrader, the, that charming motherfucker, just run off screen with a grocery cart with pumpkins in it. You can see him just yep. And there's uh, lots of like stuff happening in the backgrounds of other scenes. I want to I want to see like the animated flow chart of each individual timeline and like when they cross each other and when they're when each things yeah. are happening. Yeah. There's a moment where the kids are at the quarry and they hear wolves and someone's mm -hmm. like werewolves, uh, and that's when the the bonfire is happening with mm. the the sexy girls and stuff. It's fun with the with the, with the Anna Paquin of it all. Yeah, the Anna Paquin of it all. But yeah, um, cheers to you for doing your damnedest for <laughs> off the cuff, uh, bringing it back around the off the cuff uh, plot. And that that's a good segue here into the cocktail hour. We're mm. gonna get better about this. I took a really sweet picture and we're gonna throw it onto Instagram with along with the recipe. So this right here, this is what I'm drinking, Joe. This red cocktail that i'm drinking this is this uh -huh. is the red riding hood this is the red riding hood this Tell is uh, this is some bourbon hard apple cider and some ginger ale and uh some red food coloring but yeah so red riding hood obviously being a reference to anna paquin's character 
uh, very tongue in cheek of you know a wolf in sheep's clothing kind of thing, right? She's flipping the old fairy tale story on its head. But yeah, that one's my favorite segment of the four. Uh, and I think I told you as it was coming up, I was like, this one's my favorite. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to kind of pay homage to Anna Paquin. Yeah, I think we we both agreed that the the moment where they finally they're around the bonfire in the middle of the woods and they finally start changing into werewolves and you finally realize it's all coming together. Oh, they've been the wolves the whole time. And then um, sweet dreams are made of these by the Eurythmics uh, really slowed down as a cover starts playing Mm -hmm. was we both agreed that that was kind of the most amazing part of the movie. Yeah, Um, they almost didn't use that song. They almost used a completely different song. It was uh, perfect, but it needed to be a little more gritty, a little more um, sinister. So they used Marilyn Manson's cover of Sweet Dreams. That's what it was, yeah. And that's the only one of the only things. There's two things that stand out in this movie that do not hold up, and one of it is being this is Marilyn Manson. You know, turns out he's a shitbag, right? So that that's, that's maybe the only not give him money. Yeah, that's the only thing that kind of sucks the joy out of that scene. Other than that, like it's still rad. Um, it's mm-hmm. still a neat choice. Uh, and then the other one, they just throw out an R word slur couple times and it uh man it sucks I did notice that i was like wow yeah 2007 2007 is really showing its true colors at the time um i think i mentioned it last time you know like the obama years hadn't come in yet so we weren't the best <laughs> america we could be at that point so it's it's a it's a big bummer but yeah, yeah. what are you what are you drinking over there joe uh let me tell you about my cocktail it's uh called <laughs> the leslie bib Aww. um and I'll tell you why it is uh, made of gin, lemon juice, simple syrup, and egg whites. Great. Um, it's a little bitter. It doesn't vibe with the Halloween <laughs> spirit at all. Nope. And uh, I feel like Sam Rockwell would like it. Uh, it's the Leslie Bibb. It's the Leslie Bibb. Well, cheers. Well done, sir. I like cheers. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope you take a picture of it. If not, you can make another one and, and i did i just awkwardly took a pic now and we'll we'll okay. post it later we'll we'll hit it up on the on the ig uh for you <laughs> folks don't forget at ucu podcast always be plug in right so i like how we're <laughs> we're podcast but also slowly but surely becoming a cocktail influencer instagram uh as well <laughs> plan we just got to make sure to throw in those hashtags of cocktail yeah. hour with joe and justin that's the new yeah. thing that's what it'll be but yeah, so here's the here's the heart of the episode. Here's what what makes what we do here at the Uncultured Cinematic Universe special. This is why this movie is important to me, and I wanted to talk about it for a bit. So obviously, I mentioned at the top, I have a penchant for some reason for anthologies. This one just is my spooky season pick. Uh, on the way home from the theater, Joe, I mentioned that uh, my wife and I came up with just this off-the-cuff rhyme that is very true. Um, so... <laughs> Spooky season isn't complete until you watch Trick or Treat. (laughs) And we live by that. So, like, in all honesty, I have seriously seen this movie every single year, every single spooky season for probably the last 10 years uh, without fail. It's just a a thing that I do. I have to watch this movie. Where, Uh, Where did you first watch it, if not in theaters? So, I saw it in probably, um, probably late 2009 or 2010 um, with my buddy Chase uh, who lives out in uh, East, East, East Atlanta. Shout Um, out to Chase. Shout out to Chase Fiorenza folks. (laughs) (laughs) He's a, you know, classic horror fiend. Um, Him and his dad love the classic uh, John Carpenter, 1978 uh, Halloween. He watches that one every year, Um, but he's a seeker of the weird and obscure kind of movies. And Mm -hmm. he was, this was like a, Hey, this movie just came out, you know, it's really cool. You need to check it out. Um, It's perfect for Halloween season. It's really weird. It's rare. It's got a couple people you may recognize, but like we should check it out. And like, I immediately loved the vibe. Joe, this is a hundred percent another vibe film. It's a vibe. It is a hundred percent a vibe. It captures everything that I love about a spooky movie. You know, I liked the, the push and pull of like the horror with the humor uh, for sure, the the gross outs, the body horror, and then especially werewolves. Werewolves are my favorite, like supernatural being. Like vampires are cool, but they're overdone. Zombies are cool, but they've also been played to death. But like werewolves are like my sweet spot. Um, mm. And then it's just like cool ghost stories and 
all that kind of stuff. It hits all of the points uh, that I love. Um, yeah. yeah, I was trying to think of like uh, where I first kind of encountered this movie because I was definitely familiar. I wasn't really familiar with the plot at all going into this, but I was definitely familiar with like the character of Sam, who's yeah. like kind of the interconnector between all of these stories. He's the little kid with the the pumpkin mask on. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm guessing it's just cause I had seen so many images of him. He's kind of like the icon for the film. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's weird. Cause I wouldn't have seen it at a movie theater. And, and thinking back, it's, it's probably because this movie gained a cult status so quickly yeah. that I probably would have seen it on like, you know, the best of lists for any Halloween movies out there uh, that kind of just come around every season. Yeah. This, uh, this movie, um, you know, I mentioned it, it played in some of the festival circuits and stuff. Um, But in 2009, just before it hit uh, DVD shelves, uh, they played it at comic con uh, San Diego comic con to in hall H and it was sold out and it was a packed crowd and everybody was just eating it up. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of helped propel the momentum to like go buy it off the shelves um, as soon as it started hitting shelves, it was getting sold out, like picked off immediately. Um, so, you know, they kind of knew that something was afoot and I don't know, I don't know what it is about it. Uh, that kind of just connects with that, with, with other people. And, you know, like you mentioned, like Sam is the icon of this movie. And I think over the years, he's kind of become sort of like the official unofficial symbol in a way of Halloween period the season Mm -hmm. you know you have the big serial killers from the movies from the 70s and 80s of freddy krueger and michael myers and um jason Voorhees and all this kind of stuff but for some reason like sam is just i don't know he's kind of in it in he embodies it all he does stand out because like literally within the story he is kind of the 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 Lorax of Halloween. He's making sure (laughs) that people are following the rules correctly. He's not actually a kid as we find out. Um, He's He's a pumpkin demon, (laughs) crazy pumpkin demon, but he's also not the the way he kind of stands out from that group that you're saying of like Jason and Freddie and Mike Myers and stuff. Mike Myers, Michael Myers. (laughs) Yeah, baby. Um, uh, (laughs) He's not exactly the villain of this film. And that's what I, I, I kind of liked about it. It's, yeah. it's, he's more just like a, an onlooker onlooker in certain areas. Yeah. And then you get to, you get to Brian Cox. That's more like his, his actual story is mm-hmm. when he really enters and he starts duking it out with Brian Cox in his disgusting, dirty house. You know, like it, once you take money, dirty money to off a bunch of, you know, Insanity. kids, I was like, yeah. The only thing I was thinking of during that scene is like <laughs> all of the logistics it must have taken for those parents to get together and all <laughs> agree to murder their children. Like who was the first parent to suggest it? And then who you was know? the outlier? Who was the one just like, you know what? I don't know, you guys. I don't I'm know. Insane <laughs> that they all agreed to murder their children. Yeah, right. It's, uh, you know, Ohio, you can't really pr- predict. Uh listeners in Ohio, can you please tell us like what's in the water? Uh, whatever this, this, what is this Warren Valley, Ohio? Is that a real place? And, uh, is this based on any kind of weird legend? (laughs) One, one of my notes is like, this is definitely one of those movies, the same as Hocus Pocus that falls into the bucket of like towns that are weirdly obsessed with Halloween. Yeah. Um, even like the jack-o'-lantern stuff, like I didn't even realize all of the rules around jack-o'-lantern. I don't know you're supposed to blow out jack-o'-lanterns uh, after midnight or something like that. It's, yeah. I feel like I'm going to be killed on Halloween by the spirit now. I mean, I think you've been fine up to this point, so you probably accidentally left it lit without even knowing, right? I'll use electric ones. And, you know, I was thinking about that as I was turning on my pumpkins last night. I was like, I hope Sam makes an exception for this because I'm such a You hope he's kind of like... He's kind of grown with the times. And he, <laughs> yeah, know, he understands that, you know, like, you know, he respects the, like the economy. And stuff. He 100% yeah. does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that that's why I love this movie. It just encaptures and encapsulates everything that I love about Halloween. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's just become a tradition in uh, in my life to watch this movie every single year. So, yeah, we we watched this and you mentioned uh, you love this movie. It became a cult movie. It. Uh, showcased in front of a crowd at San Diego Comic-Con, which makes total sense to me because it seems like exactly the type of film that that crowd would love because 
it's you can tell how much it loves Halloween yeah. tropes and Halloween movies and scary movies in general, while also kind of turning them on their head. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one thing I loved about each of the different stories in this uh, movie is that there's a clear there's a clear point where things get turned around and they kind of uh, they they exceed your expectations or like they reverse your expectations yeah. a little bit. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have uh, the serial killer story where he's freaking out in the backyard. He's trying to bury this body. That's I, I was just like riddled with anxiety watching that whole entire thing because he's <laughs> freaking out on screen and like mm-hmm. I'm freaking out. His son is like screaming at him and being all annoying from the 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 house and you think oh god like he's gonna go in and like kill his son like first off like why did it take him this long second off like uh, <laughs> that's gonna be horrible because this is like a five-year-old but no it turns out and i i really wasn't expecting it even though he was talking about like putting the pumpkin on ice earlier like i, I should have uh clued into that mm-hmm. uh the very last scene of that story is like <laughs> him and his son with a knife carving up this kid's head. Yeah, it's crazy. It's dark as shit. Like, so out of the four, that one that one is like my least favorite. It's the household's least favorite. Um, right. But it's it's the introduction to a lot of the the plot devices and some of the It's kind of the opener. Yeah, it's the key to, you know, some of the the subversion that's going to happen throughout the movie. Um, you know, it's it feels gritty it's a little dirty it's like i'm really uncomfortable with this like he's gonna kill his kid uh but then he doesn't and but there's it's perfectly balanced with a lot of humor and and weird stuff in there it's great i i i I think my favorite of the four vignettes was actually the the quarry one so the the legend of the dead school bus kids Mm -hmm. or whatever they officially call it so i really liked how you kind of uh, step by step into that one. So you have all these other stories happening and throughout all of them, there's these, these group of kids that are going from house to house collecting pumpkins. And my one note on that was like, if, if a kid asked for my jack-o'-lantern, I'd be like, no, no, <laughs> I'm not giving you this. Why, why are people giving them their jack-o'-lanterns? That's such a weird thing to ask. For. Um, But they're these group of like seemingly nice kids. And then it, the story turns to them and they're doing some classic like kid Halloween stuff. They're going to go to this scary place and tell a ghost story on Halloween. They uh, go to the house of this uh, strange girl, this girl who's different, and they bring her along. Uh, and it turns out that they're they're bringing her to the quarry. They tell her the story of the dead kids in the bus who died there. Uh, the production value of the bus itself, by the way, uh, when it's like submerged in the water. Ooh, amazing. yeah. Oh yeah, so there's good. like one shot where it's like all misty and dark, and the bus is like coming out. It's it looks so good, and then the uh, the I love that the subversion there once the actual so they've like they've pulled the prank on the girl, and it's like really cruel. It's these mean. It's kids. so fucking mean, uh, <laughs> and I think like the guy is actually going to be defending the girl, and he. Um, kind of has a crush on her which the other girl doesn't like and so it's it's very much like final girl vibes when the actual zombies pop out of the water and start attacking them and then one of my favorite parts that i actually cracked up with you on as it was happening is when the the girl that they were making fun of and pranking (laughs) locks them out of the elevator and just just starts going up (laughs) it was amazing and then i have i have a list of parts from this movie that i love i i can go through it but like it happens right after that that she actually comes out of the elevator and she sees Sam mm-hmm. sitting there yeah. and they kind of like give a nod of respect to each other. Absolutely. And then she goes on her way yeah. because Sam's the one that's kind of just like looking at all of this stuff happening as it's happening throughout Halloween night. Uh, I loved it. Yeah. Like um, Sam has the respect of like, Hey, you followed the rules. You know, she's you, got a jack-o'-lantern. You understand that jack-o'-lanterns need to be lit. They will protect you. Keep it lit. Um, she understands she's the innocent bystander. And that one, this just gets heavily chided throughout the whole time we're watching it at home. It's just like, fuck these kids. Fuck these bullies. They're such <laughs> asshole kids. But like you go back and you look at it like, sure, they're like 12, 13, 14 years old. And like, that's what, you know, young adolescence looks like. You're just being cruel for no reason. Uh, and, you know, it is just the taste of sweet justice when you can hear yeah. them, their flesh being torn as Rhonda is riding up the elevator and they're just 
dying this gruesome death and it's they get what they deserve for sure it is it is kind of fun how you could probably trace each of the four main stories in this movie back to like different scary movie genres like mini genres in itself so like the the kids in the quarry is definitely like stephen king vibes it's Mm -hmm. it's the bullies getting killed by the monsters it's very much kids in a little or quarry that that happens a lot in stephen king movies actually (laughs) yeah um and then there's there's the serial killer tale that also gets turned on its head there's the the monster the straight up monster tale that happens in the woods with the werewolves also not what you expect and then there's the classic like I want to call it like a house uh, Halloween movie yeah. where things are happening within an enclosed house space. Mm-hmm. And in this case, it's Brian Cox as the old version of the bus driver who is being tormented by Sam. And that's when Sam, the, the little kid with the the pumpkin mask, takes an active role in the story. And you yeah. can tell he's kind of getting revenge on this guy after so many years because he he definitely broke a lot of Halloween rules. Yeah, I'm curious as to how like... And, I, and I, on this last rewatch, I was like, why this particular Halloween does right. does Sam decide to exact his revenge? And why this exact particular Halloween did the zombie kids decide to come back? I don't know. I don't think they mentioned it if it was any kind of anniversary. Maybe they did. I think they said like 20 years or 30 years ago on Halloween, this is what happened. So maybe that kind of thing. So maybe some it vibes, but I'm not sure. It- but yeah. That I definitely thought of that for all of the stories. Like, if if these things happen on a yearly basis, how is anyone in this town still alive? alive. Yeah. So, <laughs> how like, is this serial killer still going? The only thing that makes sense is so, like, with the girl, the girls, the werewolves, they said mm-hmm. that they're just in town for the night. So they obviously they rove around, and uh, they mentioned that they were in you know, different places, different Halloweens and years past. So they do this from year to year. So they're not permanent residents. And um, obviously like the principal's background or backyard isn't just mounds of dirt. So like maybe he just recently snapped. Who knows? Maybe he killed the, his wife. Cause you know, he's like, daddy, I wish mommy was still alive. So like, did he kill the mom? <laughs> maybe he did. Um, so maybe this, that is a recent, you know, um, kind of thing that he came in but he was he used to be it seemed like he used to be a proponent of the rules of halloween he used to follow them but uh he he went too far when he comes home at night in his work clothes and sits on his porch and starts carving a jack-o'-lantern between his legs that was like one of the most disturbing parts of the movie for me oh yeah i love Um, it it's so it's you don't under you're like is he just gonna kill him on the porch and it's like he does but not in the way i expected oh yeah check your candy amazing I love it. I, I will say I didn't include it in my plot description, but I I really did like how one of the time elements of the story that you don't realize is being is being kind of fucked with is that the the guy who's stalking Anna Paquin's character, the the werewolf in secret while she's going through the party. So their story actually takes place maybe a few hours later than the serial killer story, which yep. you don't realize, and it turns out it's the same guy. So it's him later that night trying to go after another victim. And it turns out she brings him into the woods and he is her victim yep. in that case. It's, it's a good, it's a good twist. I love it. Um, yeah. I, I remember being like genuinely shocked. I was like, oh man, like that's what, when did this happen? Like, he, and then yeah. you see it later at the end, like the kid is all alone on the front porch. And you're like, oh, his dad just died and his mom's dead too. But he's also he, kind of a serial killer. So he'll be fine. He's got some sociopath vibes. Like I think he'll be just fine. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk next about, my general affinity for horror and how it kind of spurned. I think you brought it up as we were leaving and I said, we'll talk about it. So um, here's my first general memory of spookiness. Uh, You're going to laugh. This is great. Was Michael Jackson's thriller video. Oh, I could believe that. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't remember exactly when I saw it, but I had to have been four or something, at least three or four seeing it on MTV. My parents would let me watch MTV because they were cool as hell and they let me watch it. And the first time I saw it, I was like, this is the most horrifying shit I have ever seen in my entire life. And then I kept seeing it, you know, years later, but it still holds up the, the makeup and the sound effects and everything is just absolutely terrifying. Would you say that that, uh, that memory, uh, the slight trauma there made you a horror fan and also a musician later on in life. You know what? It very well could have, I, I wouldn't put it past 
that e exact occurrence. So there is that's one cornerstone to this. That is Michael Jackson thriller. So that is one corner of of me. The next one being, uh, this was my first movie ever that I saw in theaters, and it wasn't my choice. And we'll talk about this later. <laughs> I think sometime in January I want to do this. I want to do like our firsts, right? Yeah. Our first movie I, that we saw in theater. I uh, told you what mine was, but I'll I'll save it. Save it. But uh, you know, just for the spirit of 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 horror and the theme. Um, while this movie is not a true horror movie, there are horror adjacent elements to it. There's supernatural elements, spirits, afterlife, demons, death, murder, right? This is 1990s ghost. Oh, my, hell yeah. My mom took me to go see ghost for some reason. Cause she really wanted to and couldn't find a sitter, I guess, uh, her and her, her and a friend at the time. I don't remember who it was. I can't remember. Uh, mom, if you remember, let me know, shoot me a text. Um, <laughs> took us to go see it just me and her and her friend and um i remember her specifically covering my eyes during the scenes where uh somebody bad dies and gets dragged to hell there it is absolutely terrifying the sounds i still remember hearing them but not being able to see it and that's worse um but that is another cornerstone for me of like the first movie in theater that i ever saw and it kind of had like really weird dark <laughs> themes to it it's like a high concept comedy drama with romance for most of it and then yeah there's there's shadow demons towards the end so Extreme i get it dream shadow demons with Whoopi goldberg just lighten up the screen yeah so She's we got great. we got thriller we got ghost and then the last one being um nickelodeon used to do this thing on saturday nights called snick um snick was just their saturday night like block of tv it was a two-hour block of like premium their their bet the best of the best that they would bring out it was kind of their answer to you know primetime television at the time um or saturday night live that adults would watch um and this included sh uh, you know wonderful shows such as you know clarissa explains it all ren and stimpy uh, Roundhouse, they eventually added to the list Adventures of Pete and Pete, all that, Space Cases, The Secret World of Alex Mack, and Keenan and Kel, all that, all the great stuff. Um, but those first three, Clarissa, Ren and Stimpy, and Roundhouse, were the first three of the like initial run of SNCC. And I remember watching it the very first time that it debuted. It debuted August 15th, 1992. I was five years old. And <laughs> to round out the SNCC, like, compendium uh, of the night was are you afraid of the dark um was this horrifying campfire show they would tell a new story each week from one of the kids that's out in the woods uh the midnight society is what they were called and the very first episode was called the tale of the phantom cab and it's really creepy and weird when i remember it i'm sure if i were to go back and look at it with an adult set of eyes it's not that bad but um here's the plot description to that it's one sentence um, uh, two brothers, it, it's two brothers, two brothers, two brothers, uh, while lost in the woods, does that sound familiar? Come across a mysterious cab driver and a very unusual man named Dr. Vink who won't let them, uh, let any of his visitors leave unless they solve a riddle. And it's really unnerving and it's really, I don't know, just filled the with anxiety. The vibes are already off. Yeah. So five-year-old me having already seen Thriller, having already been dragged to go see Ghost, and now this is the top piece of my triangle of, of horror, uh, is this, and it just cemented in, and I was like, this uh, slaps. This is my jam. Um, I, I want to go through my evolution of like scariest movies uh, yeah. in my life uh, as it. well, but first I want to say that I also have a deep childhood connection to SNCC and I will tell you why. So we yes. did not have uh, like TV channels uh, growing up. We had like uh, movies and DVDs that we could watch, but we didn't have like cable and stuff. So we didn't have like Nickelodeon or Disney channel or anything like that. But one of the old VHSs that we had that we watched all the time was a four episode um like compendium of literally those four shows that you mentioned so it yeah. was clarissa explains it all it was ren and stimpy it was roundhouse and then it was are you afraid of the dark yeah, and so we watched that all the time and then the are you afraid of the dark this is probably i didn't i don't have it on my list but this is probably like a a 
what do you call it? Like a, an honorable mention sure. to the scariest things uh, I've seen. Our episode was called The Tale of the Lonely Ghost. And it was about uh, this girl who moves in with like her cousin and aunt or something. And then the next door house is empty uh, and they're trying to sell it. Her aunt's like a realtor. And uh, she goes and searches through the house and there's a ghost of a little girl who's mute and she shows up in the mirrors sometime. Yeah. And uh, it's really creepy. Um, it has kind of a happy ending, but it also involves people like walking into mirrors and getting trapped in mirrors. Yeah. And I was not about that. I remember that one. Um, but yeah, I, I really love that we have a shared formative experience around snake. Yeah, man. Um, I love it. That's that's what, what else you got on your list. Uh, yeah, let me go through this list because I, I told you coming out of trick or treat that it's not going to be what you expect. Um, <laughs> so let me find it. Where, where is my list? Okay. Um, as a child, I used to be extremely not into horror movies. Like we couldn't, couldn't do it. Very anxious child because like I, I took movies home with me sure. in, in my mind and in my heart and of soul yeah. and could not stop thinking about them. So the first movie I remember ever being like truly terrified by was The Witches. Uh, okay. Roald Dahl's The Witches. Yeah. People pulling their faces off, people turning into mice, all of that. Couldn't couldn't Dark. do it. Dark. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, the next movie, this is kind of a pair. Um, it's they're not horror movies. Uh, it is um, War of the Worlds with Tom Cruise. Okay. Uh, and then X-Men, the last stand. And I will tell you (laughs) why like 10 year old Joe could not like wrap his head around like people evaporating on screen and getting like, uh, vaporized. (laughs) Yeah. Can't do it. Can't Mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like did not sit well. And that happens in both of those movies. And so like truly terrified, um, Still, still, honestly, can't really do that today. That's 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 a weird huh. thing in my mind. That's a deep fear of being vaporized. I wonder if there's a word for it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's. It's just uh, the first time I saw it on screen, I was just like, nope, nope, something's something's truly deeply wrong here. No, the world of the worlds. Um, you know, that's I I that's enjoy a stressful it. movie. I enjoyed it. Yes, it is high stress, high stress, high thriller, um, jump scare big concept it's a tom cruise movie for sure um but yeah i can see how that would frighten a 10 year old yeah i mean i respect both uh, maybe not x-men 3 but war of the worlds for what it is now Uh, i think it's a well-made and interesting film that has like ups and downs in terms of uh different themes and stuff but yeah scariest movie and that was like maybe 2004 to 2006 ish Mm -hmm. until it got trumped by uh, an actual horror movie, The Ring, which Ooh. just fucking freaked me out for oh, yeah, a really long time. I just in in perpetuity. I saw that movie in theaters, and I remember my friend Brian talking about this movie in, in particular at uh, one panel at uh, Dragon Con a couple years ago or several years mm-hmm. ago. But like Ring, seeing that movie in theaters, I was probably fifteen when it came out, fourteen or fifteen. And the crowd, the everyone in the theater getting into it, being terrified together was a really fun, unique experience. And at the end, when Samara comes through the TV, literally everyone is having the exact same visceral reaction of like, I can't get farther back in my chair enough because she's actually coming for me. And I had to sleep with the lights on. The first night after I saw the theater and the next night I slept with the blanket over the TV. Yeah, (laughs) I I was just on the cusp of not being able to enjoy that like these days and I'll I'll get into it. But like horror movies these days, I think I can really enjoy if I'm watching them with a crowd in a movie theater. And some of some of the best movie theater going experiences I've had have been horror movies. Yeah. Um, So specifically like. The Visit, the M. Night Shyamalan movie uh, back in 2016-ish. With the old people, right? The one with the old yeah. people where it's all found footage. That was real fun to watch the movie. And then my favorite uh, 
movie theater experience of all time was a packed crowd here in Atlanta watching us back Ooh. in like 2018. 17, 2018. Yeah. Holy shit. That's cool. So fun. Yeah. So fun. That's awesome. Um, but then I, I also had a note around like what's my scariest movie just like right now uh, that I can think of that I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was kind of hard because it's it's hard to really define a scary movie at this point because I think the genre itself has kind of broken out into a lot of mini genres. For sure. And so yep. I, I, I tend to really like um, – Kind of like trick or treat, but uh, scary movies that have a level of comedy to them, but are also they also like have heavy emotional themes as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have the the it movies. Yep. Loved those. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe loved the first one better than the second, but whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, it goes without saying. And then you have. Uh, did you ever watch Haunting of Hill House on oh, yeah. Netflix? Oh yeah, the uh, the whole last one of my episode, favorite shows. The whole last episode is just just an emotional yeah. roller coaster the whole time, and you're like, this has wrecked me for a long time. <laughs> yeah, like it's it's truly scary at certain points, um, but it 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 also leads towards uh, emotional payoffs in ways that you don't really expect, and I, I I've really come to love that type of horror subgenre. Mm-hmm. Uh, really anything by Mike Flanagan, the guy who does Haunting of Whorehouse, uh, Whorehouse, God, oh, Haunting wow. of Hill House. Um, <laughs> Have you seen some uh, of his other his other stuff that he did? Um, yeah. Was it the Ouija? Yeah, yeah. So uh, he did uh, the Ouija movie. He did the movie Hush. Did you ever see that? Love Hush. I love Hush. Hush uh, your mouth. Hush up. It's so I, good. W- really want to be able to talk about that at some point on this uh, podcast. I love that movie. And then he did some more recent ones. Uh, did you ever see Dr. Sleep? I haven't seen Dr. Um, Sleep yet. No, I need to. I read really the book. Good. I read the book because uh, I love The Shining. Um, the Both takes on it, um, the, the book and the uh, the film as well. But uh, I've only read yeah. the, the book, Dr. Sleep. Very cool stuff. Joe, I love, I love learning this about you. And I love that we get to ex- like do this together yeah. have fun yeah dr sleep probably my my recommendation coming out of this episode if i have to give one it's go watch dr sleep but then there's, the yeah there's a couple days left before halloween and i'm gonna put that on my list so until what do it yeah um it's real fun uh the only other like scary movie i've seen in the past that i'd probably call just the most generically scary was uh the conjuring 2 You know what? I have a weird uh, thought around, or not even thought, just like just thoughts around the Conjuring movies, like Conjuring and Insidious. Like I lump them all together, and they don't scare me, and I'm not like entertained by them either because they're kind of both the same movie. So I'm coming at it from a heavy Catholic standpoint. Oh yeah, when the devil gets involved with things, things tend to get a little too real. (laughs) So. I, I've still never seen The Exorcist, so that could probably go on our list. <gasps> okay, then we'll see that one because I remember watching that as like a ten-year-old or an eleven-year-old, and then just like this is—I I believe that this is the worst thing I've ever seen. I am—I have to turn. I had to watch it with all the lights on. Anyway, so we're getting we're getting further away from from trick or treat, period. <laughs> trick but or this treat. is this has turned into horror talk, which I'm not I'm not mad about. Um, but I'm glad we're we've been able to kind of explore this a little bit. So just to kind of reel it back in, let's reel it back a little bit. And we've kind of danced around some of the cult status around this movie. Um, You know, I think the general populace and, um, you know, marketing firms and stuff latched on to the instantly recognizable imagery and iconography associated with this, this film, specifically Sam. Sam has become the quintessential icon to Halloween. And that's why there's just shitloads of merchandise everywhere around this little character that most people may not even know. Like you, like your original, you know, read on it is just like, I don't know anything about the movie, but I know who Sam is, or I know what Sam looks like and that he is from a movie, but like you kind of equate him to like a Santa Claus type of character, right? When you think of the holiday, um, it's, it's pretty great. One of the one of the parts I laughed at uh, during the movie was when he was fighting Brian Cox, and then it shows his costume has like a little like butt flap, butt flap on it. <laughs> uh, it was so cute. 
I, I kind of loved Sam throughout this whole movie. <laughs> he's got a cute little pumpkin butt. Like he's uh, wearing like a little baby onesie. Yeah, it's adorable. My daughter has a very similar like orange footy pajama thing, and it's uh, it's great. I'm gonna have to get her an actual like Sam costume. Sam for next cosplay. Year. It's gonna be great. Um, but yeah, so you know, I hit that this was completed in 2007. Um, written, directed, and all that kind of stuff by Michael Doherty. Um, you know, he said he always wondered why Halloween never had a Santa Claus like mascot, uh, or even Easter, St. Patrick's Day, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So that's why he he kind of came up with this idea of Sam being the embodiment, the spirit of Halloween itself. And um, there was an animated short that he did in 1996 called Seasons Greetings that has like a rough outline or you know a rough version of what sam would be it's this you know pajamaed little person with a burlap sack round head going around um you know in search of candy you know while he's, a... the, he's the prototypical trick-or-treater yeah it, exactly that's exactly what he is um you know there's a silent stranger that kind of like stalks him through the night and uh he ends up kind of just offing him at the end it's super cool i it's only a it's three minutes long and it's really cool, and you can kind of see where some of the seeds were planted. Um, but yeah, so Doherty did this as a student at NYU in 1996 and was told by students and staff and all the friends, you know, like, you should make this this concept into a feature length. And it, you know, took him 10 years uh, in the making to get there. But, you know, hats off to him for doing it because he created one of the coolest things uh, that the, the Halloween season uh, – you know, has gotten since, you know, like I mentioned, Freddy, Jason, um, Chucky, all the shit. It's super cool. Good for him. This is like, this is kind of noticing through lines here. This is our second episode in a row where a creator has taken something they've done in the past in a small form and expanded on it, expanded on it to kind of be either a full length miniseries or a full length feature film. In this case, I wonder, uh, Again, like in the way that you're you're attracted to anthologies in these ways, like it seems like you're also driven by uh, these types of uh, they had small beginnings, but became something bigger. And there's a definite pro, 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 there's a progression in the yeah. director's work there. Yeah. Even, you know, uh, to episode two or whatever it was with uh, with Pulp Fiction, same kind of thing. That was mm -hmm. the thing that propelled Quentin Tarantino into you know, the zeitgeist. Um, yeah, I don't know why I'm attracted to that kind of thing, that kind of you, storytelling. It's just, that's my you like directors with You like directors with vision. With vision, with hunger, with a, you know, with yes. a, this is what's right to me in my, in my gut. Um, <clears throat> another call out that I wanted to do about this movie. Uh, so obviously, uh, going back to the year 2017, um, by that point, this movie had been out by about eight years or so. And it had mm -hmm. uh, reached a pretty critical, you know, cult status. Um, it was picked up by Universal Studios' Halloween Horror Nights. In 2017, it was a dedicated, uh, or it was just a scare zone at that time. Um, easy to kind of like recreate Warren Valley, Ohio, uh, in a small little corridor uh, throughout the, um, the park for, you know, this this uh, horror event uh, for those of you who don't know universal uh, halloween horror nights is a thing that's very near and dear to my heart that i love so much i like i like to go to it whenever i can i haven't been able to in the past couple of years due to the state of the world um and things like that and also having a baby uh, it kind of changes things if but, you uh, if your movie makes it to universal studios halloween horror night you've you've made it you have 100 percent made it yeah so uh well done mike doherty you've made it in 2017 retroactive but <clears throat> um so yeah uh halloween horror nights is a universal studios it's a thing in florida there's also one in hollywood and uh, somewhere in tokyo i think and a couple other places but um throughout the month of september and october they do oh no my camera's about to turn off i promise i'm still here joe don't worry throughout september and october they like to do this thing where after hours they set up um haunted houses in the parks and some of like back lots and, you know, random spots throughout the, the park. And you can still ride rides. Uh, it's super cool. It's really immersive. There's tons of fog. 
there's music going all the all the uh, all over the whole the whole time, and a lot of the houses are usually centered around either some kind of IP. Um, they usually do like a, a Halloween house. In the past couple of years, they've done a Stranger Things house whenever they get the rights to it. Um, they've done a Killer Clowns from Outer Space house. And a lot of the times, um, the rest of the houses are made up of just like original ideas that the, the cast and crew uh, on set come up with, which is really rad. Uh, my, my main experience with Universal Halloween Horror Nights is I, I went there maybe about five years ago with my nieces and nephews who were really young at the time. And we went during the day to actually just like experience the park. And then as the sun was going down, we had to like run to the exit because <laughs> people were starting to come out of the shadows. They, yeah. they don't really like ring a bell or anything when it starts to change over. It's like, you got to go. Yeah. Uh, so it's just us with a group of kids uh, <laughs> running through these, these zombie actors. Mm hmm. So fun. How cool is that? It was fun. It was yeah. Fun. But yeah, so it started out as a, just a scare zone, which is just like a, a place that people just walk through going from place to place throughout the park. It's a very small place. But then the next year in 2018, um, they brought them back to do a dedicated spot on house. And I went that year and it was so cool. Um, mm -hmm. They faithfully like recreate so many iconic scenes from that movie. Like you walk through... You know, Mr. Krieg's, Brian Cox's house, um, which is really cool. You can see up the stairs and you can see a Sam run by as the light flashes. Um, they did a really cool, uh, you know, sh replica of the bus coming out of the lake um, with some of those zombie kids kind of like peeking out behind to scare you. It's, it was rad. Do they do they build like net new stuff or are they repurposing current rides at Universal? So they don't touch the rides. These are right. like usually in like a big warehouse areas, usually for storage or for overfill or whatever that they need it for. But most of the time, these are built and made for these specific events or this specific event. Um, surely they repurpose um, a lot of set pieces or whatever, but a lot of the times they make brand new things to kind of, at least for you know some of the IP things, they have to make it look exactly like this one shot or something like that. It's super cool. That's so fun. And it's probably a super fun way for like, like you're saying, literally those, those set pieces to kind of see the light of day once more and entertain people. Yeah. And it's really for the super fans like myself to like be on set and kind of like be a part of the movie, which is really cool. Um, mm. A couple of years ago, they did a Ghostbusters one and that was awesome to like walk on the rooftop and, you know, have Zool be right there and just <laughs> in all their glory. Super cool. Um, so yeah, this so, is a Universal Studios fan podcast, by the way. We're definitely Universal and not Disney. Definitely not Disney. Hashtag Universal forever. That's the number four. <laughs> um, so we already kind of talked through some of the standout scenes and some other things. So I kind of wanted to hit you with some some trivia and Easter eggs, and we'll go through it. Oh, um, get at me. Yeah. So yeah. So the kid at the beginning that you see in the costume shop that is peeking into the girl's dressing rooms like a fucking creep. Um, <laughs> that kid's name is Quinn Lord. He is also the same actor who played Sam. That is so fun. Isn't what it? a fun little tidbit for that kid. Like he doesn't have to have his face plastered all over things no. to like ruin him as a child actor, but he's like, yeah, yeah that's I play me. this iconic uh, Halloween character. That's me. Yeah, super cool. Um, most of the jack-o'-lanterns on set, not real. They were ceramic or foam, obviously. Like, you can't just have real pumpkins. They would just rot. Well, Sam's going to get him for that. Or Sam's going to get him. But, you know, the rest of the crew was never heard from again. Uh, yeah, uh, I mentioned... One of, those, one of those cursed productions. <laughs> it really is. Uh, the first five minutes, you know, like I mentioned, has numerous amounts of overlap. Characters pop up and cross over throughout numerous points throughout the film. You know, the clown kids that... Um, uh, they come up on the scene like just as uh, Leslie Bibbs characters get killed. You see them later in the movie as they're knocking on Mr. Krieg's door. Um, you know, the school bus kids in the background, Schrader running off uh, with the grocery cart. Super cool stuff. So here's something that's interesting. Theme, thematics. Love it. Uh, the, the main theme that comes through each one of these stories uh, is an individual's journey through experiencing Halloween. So come with me for this. 
introducing the holiday, the rules, the traditions, being young, that's the principal storyline. You know, he kind of sets it up, introduces some of the, the plot things. Uh, and also right. there is a kid, there's a child there experiencing these things. Um, as you grow up a little bit more into adolescence, you know, you're trick-or-treating on your own with your friends uh, and you're kind of scaring your friends and maybe you do a, a cruel prank here and there. Um, that's the ghost story. That's the ghost um, school bus massacre storyline. Uh, then you get a little bit older into your 20s uh, where it's all about drinking and partying and having sex and murder. You know, Halloween has to become sexy. Yeah, and that's the werewolf storyline, right? That's what they're, they're after. They're after just fresh meat that they're in town to just party, hang out and drink and murder and go out. Uh, that's, that's that line. And then the last segment being Mr. Krieg, it's you're in your twilight years, you're over it. You're essentially the Scrooge of Halloween. And it's come full circle. It's it's life, baby. I love that the implication here is that you go from your sexy 20s straight, straight. into it's, like old age. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I am over it. I'm not about this anymore. Please there leave is, me alone. There are no middle-aged people on Halloween. Yeah. Um, here's another interesting standout. All of the kills are either off camera or cut away just before. Um, it's not a super bloody, gory movie. No. Really. Yeah, there's there's blood to be seen, um, but it's not like sprayed like you see in a very graphic kind of way. So I bet, you know, the, the MPAA didn't have to have anybody's ass for this movie, <laughs> which is good to see. Um, and last little thing here, uh, the werewolf transformations. Uh, that took place in the woods. Um, most of those were practical with very little CG enhancements. It it was very cool um, how they very much showed them like ripping their skin off, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they, like they weren't trying to be super sexy about it, but also the, the actual werewolf, the full on werewolf head that they do show that's kind of howling is very like, jim henson-esque like it doesn't look like an actual wolf it looks like it's a puppet but it's it, it's still it's, real it's it kind scary. of brings you in in that way yeah it feels like a classic uh halloween movie monster type thing yeah apparently the crew that worked on those wolves uh did some of the underworld uh kate uh beckett kate beckinsale beckinsale, beckinsale. <laughs> i was like kate blanchett that's not it that's a different kate um, that would be amazing wow no she she makes an appearance at the end um, but yeah, that's, that's all some of the, the trivia and Easter eggs. I kind of wanted to give you that stand out for me. Um, yeah, this, I love this movie so much. My favorite segment is the, the werewolf one, just because like super cool transition. It's a neat, like turn on its head. I remember seeing it for the first time. I was like, are they like witches or vampires? Oh. Are they really vampires? What are they going to do? It's like, oh no, they're werewolves. I, that's so cool. I turned to you at almost the beginning of that segment and I was like, they're going to eat that guy. Yeah. But what I didn't know is like what they were, like you're mm -hmm. saying. Um, I didn't really catch on to that until almost the very end. I was like, are they some sort of like siren character? Yeah. Just like cannibals. But My, then they, they do drop clues. They um, drop she says, numerous yeah. clues throughout. And the very first one that they do when they're at the costume shop and they're trying to get her to come out of the door and they're like, come on out. And she's like, no, I look stupid. And they're like, come on out or we'll huff and we'll puff. And it's just like, oh, that's so good. They, they're genius. They know what they're doing. They Her mom doing. says she's the, runt, the runt of the litter, all this stuff. Yeah, it all comes together. And then they turn into really rad werewolf babes and just tear, tear that guy a new one. Super cool. So Joe, give me some of your closing thoughts, closing arguments. I had some thoughts. Give them to me. Let me kind of just run through them. Um, so looking through my notes, uh, I had a note around uh, the idea of like horror in the form of jump scares, mm -hmm. which I think, again, if you look at horror movies that we've been talking about is almost like a subgenre in and of itself. You have horror movies that are really heavy on comedy or emotion. And then there's horror movies that are really heavy on like religious themes. And then there's horror movies that rely mainly on jump scares like 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 this, this movie tries to kind of subvert in certain ways. Yep. And what was interesting to me watching this is that becoming more and more of a horror fan in the past few years, you really start to get a sixth sense, no pun intended, around 
when a jump scare is going to happen. And yeah. so you kind of know, and it doesn't necessarily startle you in a way, but it's still fun to enjoy. Yeah. Like I'll, 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 I'll watch a movie with, with my boyfriend and he, he doesn't do horror. At I know all, you told me I'll, that. And I was like, how do you even watch these movies? I guess I'll be able to look at the movie and tell him like five seconds before it happens. I'm like, okay, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to turn your head. Yeah. You know. This is going to be bad. Yep. Very once much wants me to spoil it with him, but that also makes it all the more effective when a jump scare is used uh, when you don't expect it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I I always think of the example of Haunting of Hill House. There's a really famous jump scare in that TV show that uh, I, (laughs) when I was watching it, I was like alone in my parents' basement because it was like over Thanksgiving or some reason. And I was kind of lying on the floor in front of the TV and my body may be lifted about six, <laughs> six to 12 inches off the ground I it. fully yeah. when one of those jump scares happens. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's an overused tool that when used right, uh, oh, man, is, is, it is all the more effective. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So kind of like establishing that language around horror movies has been a really cool way to evolve in my appreciation of horror movies. Like I know yeah. what should happen when I know the tropes, right? Yeah. And this one kind of, you know, uh, paid homage to it as well as subverted it. And Mm -hmm. um, one of our lost episodes that we did where we talked about Scream, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was that had a a hand in influencing this movie with the opening scene where like there's a kill immediately when you think that that person's going to hang around. Um, This movie has a lot of pays a lot of homage to, you know, the original Halloween, um, The Thing. Uh, just a, just a lot of great stuff, and you know, like I said, it's a, just a classic love story to horror and Halloween. Period. For any new listeners out there, Scream is one of the first episodes that we did, and it ended up being about two and a half hours long, and it didn't really have the structure that we were going for. So it may be released as a bonus episode in the future. Stay tuned. Um, I do have a list of uh, parts of this movie that I loved that we maybe haven't covered real quick. And then I have a list of times that I cracked up. Yep. Uh, Yep. So parts that I loved uh, Rhonda and Sam nodding at each other in Mm. respect. I really loved that little moment. That's good. Uh, Leslie Bibb just fucking hating Halloween while she's dressed as like this fucking robot. robot. Yeah. Leslie Bibb being psycho and deciding to clean up the Halloween decorations in her lawn the night of, because uh, she's just so over she's it. Over My it. note she's here is Sam was justified in uh, what he did. Definitely. Um, the uh, We were talking about homages to other horror movies. There's a very clear one that I caught. There's a Pet cemetery reference in here where Sam slices the Achilles tendon of Brian yes, Cox when he's 100%. under the bed. Yeah, that's uh, how he gets um, old man uh, Judd. Yeah. So fun. Good catch. Good I love catch. movie connections. Um, and then I, I, I kind of turn to you. I I should have seen it coming, but I love when all these stories come together at the end and they're all in that final scene. Uh, all these characters are kind of reaching the end or the beginning or the middle of their story in that final scene together on the street. And you don't even realize it until the very end when it kind of runs through that scene from a different perspective. Yeah. It's real. Uh, it's just a simple like camera panned up and you can see like Rhonda's face and you can see the girls in the car and mm-hmm. you can see the, you know, the zombie kids leaving off camera and like it all comes together right there. And it's, it's beautiful. I love it. And there's, there's a shot of uh, the old man and Sam kind of like sharing one last look uh, while he's standing up on his porch and Sam is standing on the ground and he's about to go over and murder Leslie Bibb and, the old man yeah. just kind of turns back inside before he uh, eventually meets, gets meets his end. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, this last time we saw it, I had a, a thought of, uh, uh, I can't, I think it was season two, Rick and Morty with uh, <laughs> Michael Crumbopulous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just like, well, here I go, killing again. <laughs> and that's, Oops, uh, here I go. That's exactly what, uh, what Sam had to do. He's like, oh, I got to go kill this lady real quick. You, st- you stay good. Like, we got an understand, but I got to go kill her real there's, quick. There's a weird amount of respect there. But I, I also, I was sitting next to you in the theater and I did kind of crack up laughing a few times. So the Sweet Dreams uh, sequence with the werewolves, I thought was hilarious and campy and awesome. Um, 
a lot of the Brian Cox storyline with the old man in the house getting tormented by Sam, there were so many funny bits with the hand getting cut off and moving on its own like thing from the Adams family. There's a point where he gets to a phone and he dials 911 and this is like a tiny two second bit, but they put him on hold and some hold music starts playing. <laughs> I know it's so and funny. I died. Um can 911 uh, do that? Can they put you on hold? I don't, I don't even, think so. I don't think so. 911, <laughs> please like, hold. And then like elevator music starts playing. Um God, and then dude. so he the old man gets a hold of a shotgun and he finally shoots Sam and <laughs> Sam's body just like being flung across the room for some reason. I, I found that darkly funny. Oh yeah. Um, Sam having a razor blade in his uh, candy that he slowly unwraps and that's what he attacks him with. Uh, Ooh, that was he awesome. Got, he got that candy from Mr. Wilkins house next door from oh, his candy bucket. There and, you go. And it had a razor in it because Wilkins was poisoning all the candy. Wilkins was the one, uh, he's, he's the urban legend of people poisoning candy, and it's, he's the reason why you have to check he all the He definitely is. He definitely is. He's another Halloween staple. Yep. Um, yeah, and then the, the kid that Wilkins is poisoning just throwing up for so, so long. much <laughs> and so long. It's like a it's a 30-second sequence of him just throwing up blood and chocolate i guess chocolate and um, then just like these steps his innards and it's so good it's so gross out and just over the top campy i love it though <laughs> um and then my final thought uh, i wanted to ask you this question like looking at this movie there was a real emphasis on like horror costumes as part of halloween but i feel like these days no one really wears scary costumes right it's more of just like you're dressing up as a movie character or something like that what is yeah that's my experience what is what is your experience with halloween costumes these days it it weaves in and out i think a lot of um cosplay culture you know has kind of bled into halloween uh cosplay being you know you're just playing as a character that you enjoy uh but in costume um you know that's popular at uh, you know, like festivals or um, like Comic Con or Dragon Con, just any con, really. Uh, it's uh, popular to dress up as a, your favorite fandom or something like that. And I think, you know, it's over the past, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, the commercialization of uh, Halloween in general, the, um, the popularization of like kids' characters that are like easy to emulate, you know, like Power Rangers, starting with Power Rangers and all the way up through like Paw Patrol and that kind of stuff where it's easy to kind of like capitalize on that. Um, so I think it's an interesting blend where like probably majority of people dress up as a character of sorts. It's not, it's no longer just like I'm a ghoul or a goblin or whatever. Mm -hmm. There, there is still that, but I think it's majority, you know, it's what you can grab off the shelf and you are now Sarah Sanderson from Hocus Pocus or something, you know? It's yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I think it's it's really the popularity of cosplay uh, mm. has really ingrained itself into Halloween. So you you find yourself emulating specific people as opposed to ideas yeah. and scary concepts. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. Nerd culture has has uh, definitely taken a step into the limelight. What's, what's your what's your favorite Halloween costume you've ever done? My favorite Halloween costume I ever did was based on an R.L. Stein Goosebumps book. Um, I can't recall that it was something to do with Jack lanterns. I can't remember the name of it, but I was really excited. I bought a foam craft pumpkin and um, I carved the Jack lantern face on it and I wore it on my head and I wore like almost the exact same clothes that one of the main characters had at the cover. Um, and that's what it, it's that, the, it's the cover with the, the Jack and lantern head kids. Yeah. There was like five kids or something walking down a street. And uh, I think that was one of the most recent uh, Goosebumps books that I'd ever read and I was like I'm gonna do that for Halloween and it was awesome because like I made it you know um, that was one of my favorite ones very nice 100%, 100%. Goosebumps rocks Goosebumps rules uh, we should watch that movie and talk about it because I haven't seen it yet um, cool that's been Trick or Treat uh, my favorite Halloween movie I've seen it for the past 10 years and I will continue to see it uh, I'm gonna pass the torch on to my daughter and she's going to watch it as well because she's going to love it too. It's going to be great. Um, Very nice. It's going to be a thing. So here we are. 
We're at the very end again. We've reached it. End games, Joe. Um, so the game we were going to play, I hadn't thought of a name yet, so you can pick whichever one you like the most. Um, <laughs> it's either going to be Everybody Wants to Rule the World or Three Rules to Rule Them All. Take your pick. That's what that is. So here's the here's the concept. Um, and we, da- we danced around this. We talked about it. So throughout the movie, there are official, unofficial rules that they bring up. Um, wear a costume, pass out candy, keep your jack-o'-lantern lit, and always check your candy. Now, with those four rules, we have learned that Sam is the enforcer of those rules throughout the movie. So, Joe, for the following three holidays, what are the three (laughs) official, unofficial rules and who is the holiday's rule enforcer? We'll come right back to Everybody Wants to Rule the World with Joe. Yes, it is. The call is still important to us, folks. Welcome back to the Uncultured Cinematic Universe. And we're going to play Everybody Wants to Rule the World with Joe. And for those just catching up, uh, Joe, here's the rules. For the following three holidays, what are the three official, unofficial rules? And who is that holiday's rules enforcer? Okay. You know, a normal person would have given me the three holidays before the hold music to think through, but I love that we're just jumping into this. We're just doing it because these are going to be easy. These are going to be fun. Um, so I'm just going to give you the first holiday and you tell me the rules and the enforcer, and then we'll move to the next one. I'm not going to give you too much time to think about it. You ready? Okay. Do it. These are, these are going to be great. They're going to increase in level of difficulty. Um, Christmas. Christmas. Okay. The three rules for Christmas is, are... Um, if you're opening presents with a group of people, you all always have to open them, uh, one person at a time so that everyone can see and appreciate what everyone else gets. I do agree with that at the same time, like a bunch of ravenous wolves, which I think is primitive. Mm -hmm. Um, rule number two is whenever you're, uh, eating a candy cane, you have to sharpen it into a shiv first, um, before, uh, eating the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Rule number three, uh, you have to put the star on the tree last. Um, Ooh, yes. Yeah, as the final thing. Don't you dare put the, that tree on first. <laughs> the enforcer of these Christmas rules is uh, Rudolph's forgotten younger brother, Randall. Randall. <laughs> is he also red-nosed? No. Ah, uh, poor it's guy. It's blue. It's blue. The blue-nosed reindeer, Ran- Randolph. <laughs> oh, Randall, not Randolph. <laughs> he hates okay. when people get those messed up. Yeah, I believe it. Okay, so that's Christmas. Those are three really great rules, and I abide by them 100%. So I am yeah. safe from Randall's wrath, the wrath of Randall. Um, next holiday, Joe, Valentine's Day. Okay, um, <laughs> Valentine's Day. Rule number one is that you um, have to have a date for Valentine's Day. Mm. Um, I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. Uh, pair up, y'all. Pair up. Um, rule number two: uh, you you can't uh, eat dinner at a place that you've been to before, <laughs> unless it was another Valentine's Day. Oh, love so that. So you better have a Valentine's restaurant that is only a Valentine's restaurant. Yep. Uh, in mind. Yep. Rule number three is. Um, <laughs> You have to leave uh, Candy Hearts out for St. Valentine, who comes at 2.45 a.m. every night. Love that. Is St. Valentine the enforcer? You would think uh, Mm -hmm. that St. Valentine is the enforcer, but no, it's actually uh, Cupid who drives around on a tricycle shooting people with uh, arrows. I love it tricycle make them fall in love so uh if you if you don't have a partner on valentine's day the arrows become real arrows (laughs) the arrows become real (laughs) that's great mid-air yeah 
like you're mid kiss, you're almost there, but you don't quite yeah. make it. Dead. It's like eleven fifty nine on Valentine's Day, and someone's getting chased by Cupid, <laughs> trying to find someone else. I would watch that movie. Uh, all right, That'd be and a last horrible, mm-hmm. horrible movie. That would be <laughs> last. Here we go. Arbor Day. Arbor Day. Uh, are you ready for this? Because it's not going to be what you expect. Um, Arbor Day, rule number one, you must eat a hot dog underneath the shade of a tree. Mm. Rule number two, for every tree you plant, you have to cut down two because there's too many trees out there. (laughs) Rule number three, um, don't forget about, uh, the, the seaweed. So people are always planting trees for Arbor Day, but, uh, we get most of our oxygen from the, the plants that float on the ocean anyway. So <laughs> don't forget the seaweed. Um, <laughs> you really should be planting seaweed instead of trees. I love it. And who is the and enforcer the, for Arbor day? The enforcer for Arbor day uh, in line with what I just said is a one eyed dolphin named Frank. One eyed dolphin named Frank. <laughs> if you're on land, he won't get you, but you're he'll, good. he'll, He'll remember. He'll remember next time you try to get into the water. He'll come get you. I love that. Joe, you did so good at Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Uh, we'll that bring that up next time. stressful. Yeah, you know what? I, I like to keep you on your toes and leave you with a heightened sense of cortisol in your blood uh, when we're done <laughs> with this podcast. This is great. So uh, that's it. We've did it. Uh, Trick or Treat from 2007. Technically 2009 cult sleeper hit. Um Love this movie. It's Halloween. If you haven't checked it out, uh, I highly recommend you do and make it a, a family staple in your household. Um, yeah, Joe, what else you got? Justin, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad I let you kind of drive this Halloween mini series uh, to kind of close it out. And yeah. we are really looking forward uh, to future mini series uh, that we can do. Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're already talking about potential Christmas ideas. So yeah. look, keep an eye out for that in the future. Yeah, definitely keep up with us on Instagram at UCU Podcast. And uh, be sure to catch us on YouTube or wherever else you get your podcast, Spotify and Apple. Um, do the thing, uh, watch the movies, and uh, join in on the conversation. Uh, this has been the Uncultured Cinematic Universe. We'll catch you guys later. Bye. Happy Halloween.